Anyway, so my, my, my plan was to joke about, you know, asking, uh, sorry, thanking the organizer for putting us in a hotel uh, right next to the beach, but then the, the schedule runs to 11 p.m., so I'm not even sure, you know, if I need to thank for anything, but uh, except for, you know, letting me talk to you, of course. Right, so uh, my uh, goal here, as was uh, sort of uh, formulated by the organizers, well, Maya, um, is, is to talk about basics and get you through, you know, uh, transport uh, and, you know, scattering and, you know, magnetic resistance type stuff. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do, but today I'll start with uh, sort of more like thermodynamics of, of crystal electrons in, uh, in crystal to set the stage for uh, Professor Moll's uh, talk uh, later on. So Philip will, uh, will, uh, will go fancy with this magnet oscillation phenomenon. I'll, I'll go through the basics. Okay, so just a couple of words on the, uh, on the outline. So as I said, uh, today I hope to get to the quantum magnet oscillation phenomenon. So <laughs> for the lecture two, you know, I have basically notes on more or less all of this, and you can tell this is impossible, okay? So, uh, I mean, uh, you tell me what to do or we'll see, but I, I want to, to talk about uh, magnetoresistance, which is a beast of a topic, of course, it's super annoying, but uh, one, one has to talk about it. And then about uh, what's, what's beyond uh, BRE phase, about this extrinsic contribution to anomalous Hall effect, and in particular, the side jump one, which sort of uh, is a, is a uh, very tricky uh, contribution that can, you know, can uh, change the uh, sign of the Berry curvature effectively and things like that. So I think one should be at least aware of these things. So we'll see how that goes uh, basically tomorrow. But tomorrow is mostly transport. Today is mostly not transport. Okay. So another, another thing is that, you know, the lecture notes for this lecture, you know, uh, uh, have been published. Okay. So... <laughs> Uh, I will, of course, uh, provide, you know, handwritten notes, uh, somewhat, you know, shortened version of this. Uh, and related to that is the fact of uh, this, the question of the format. So I basically were encouraged to give you uh, Blackboard lectures, but with, you know, iPads. And that's what I meant to do, you know, like write notes, then erase whatever I don't want to appear and then write it. But I'm realizing now it's going to be a disaster if I do that, okay? And partially, uh, the reason is that, you know, I'm very tall and this is not too tall. So if, if I write with my elbow like this, you know, game over. You'll, you'll see my handwriting is not great, even if I sort of uh, try. So uh, basically, I'll try and pull off this, you know, uh, PowerPoint type lecture with handwritten notes. Uh, so yell at me if this doesn't work. But it should be fine, you know. Um, anyways, so let's, let's get started. So... Let me talk about, you know, band theory of solids. I don't mean to imply that you do not know that, but I need this, you know, for a continuity to discuss sort of levels of description of, uh, of this problem. So as you uh, very well uh, uh, know, uh, you know, the, the problem of electron motion on a lattice is very much quantum mechanical, right? So one needs to solve the Schrodinger equation to, uh, to uh, get the spectrum of the problem. Uh, you know, uh, thanks to Bloch, we know that the wave functions the way functions, basically, of electrons uh, in a crystal have this form. They have a, um, a plane wave part and then a modulation part periodic uh, in, the, uh, in the lattice. And, of course, uh, because the plane wave part is uh, completely generic, the entire information about the crystal is actually hidden in these periodic uh, modulating uh, parts of the block, block wave. So uh, what does one do? Basically, one solves the Schrodinger equation on the lattice, either uh, for the full Hamiltonian or for the so-called, you know, this sort of gauged out uh, Bloch Hamiltonian, and then uh, solves just for the periodic, uh, periodic parts. And um, basically, the uh, physically distinct uh, solutions um, of, of this problem, of the Schrodinger equation, uh, fill up a chunk of momentum space, the brilliant zone, which, as, uh, of course, uh, uh, was mentioned by David, and uh, you probably knew that, is, a, um, is a really a torus, okay? So, okay. So the result of the solving of the uh, band calculation problem is a band structure. And really what it means is that to every point in momentum space, you associate a certain uh, energies, band energies, and the corresponding wave functions. Okay? That's pretty similar, uh, pretty simple so far. Okay? So, however, the, the very existence of, of these two uh, objects, objects, uh, the energy and the wave function, leads to two types of geometry in metals. The, the old type, the useful type, 
is the Lifshitz, Asbel, Kaganov type geometry. I, I'm just mentioning the last names that contributed sort of uh, in a gigantic way to the, uh, uh, to the subject. And this is a geometry of isoenergetic surfaces in a crystal. And in particular, the most important of them, the Fermi surface. Okay? So you see uh, the uh, Fermi surface of even very simple elemental uh, metals like lead can be beasts like that. Okay, so and you can basically study what that Fermi surface uh, looks like. Okay, and there are methods to do that. Uh, I will mention them. You know, Philip will I will mention them. And this is a geometry as you usually imagine it. Okay, so you know that <clears throat> uh, you can, for example, study uh, intrinsic curvature of a of a uh, surface. Right, you know that you need to basically take a vector in the uh, tangent uh, tangent plane, drag it through through a chunk of this uh, surface without rotation around the uh, local normal. That's the condition of parallel transport. And if, if your vector got rotated when you got to the initial point, then your surface is curved, okay? In this sense, sphere is curved, cylinder is not curved, so on and so forth. So this is the usual, you know, Riemann-type uh, geometry for your surfaces that you can think of. And, you know, studying these Fermi surfaces uh, led to this field of Fermiology, which we'll try to build basically together today. So it turns out that Basically, any type of geometry is about, you know, transport of something. It's, it's the something that changes from geometry to geometry. So in this Pancharatnam Berry geometry, I, I had Pancharatnam because he did uh, very much the same thing, but uh, in the uh, context of optics, okay, uh, and, and before uh, everybody else. Um, basically, it's a transport of, of uh, wave functions, wave function phases around uh, manifolds, around bands in the brilliant zone. And the same, the same way happens, basically, you go through a closed contour in the, uh, uh, in the band. The parallel transport condition is substituted with the uh, adiabaticity condition that you don't go to any other band. And basically, if you get a uh, finite phase accumulation, you say that your band is very curved. Okay, and, you know, basically, you play all the games that uh, David described. So, uh, basically, it turns out that the methods developed to study the first type of geometry are actually useful uh, to, to study the second, the Berry uh, type of geometry. And my goal right now is, is to introduce, you know, the ideas be, uh, uh, behind these methods, you know, uh, to you in uh, this lecture. So um, you haven't been particularly shy about asking questions, so I don't have to encourage that, I guess. But, you know, uh, let me just mention that, you know, it's okay to, to, to interrupt me and, and discuss that. That's the uh, sort of important part. Okay. So, let's now talk about uh, uh, thinking about um, what electrons uh, do in uh, lattices. And uh, it turns out that uh, unlike response to atomic fields, okay, uh, which are very strong, they vary on very short atomic distances, responses to uh, lab fields, transport fields, uh, are actually very, very different. So, lab fields are way, way weaker they change uh, way uh, more uh, smooth, smoother in real space. They are uh, very, very uh, slow in, uh, in time. So often the response to such fields is completely classical. Okay? So the uh, precise criterion should really be formulated from problem to problem. But uh, roughly speaking, if you have a scale separation, right? if you have a separation between the atomic scale and the uh, variation, um, scale of variation of... Uh, electric field, magnetic field, um, uh, you know, lab fields, okay? Then you can build wave packets that are large as compared to the lattice, uh, uh, lattice uh, constant, but are small compared to the uh, scale on which the uh, transport uh, fields uh, uh, vary. And such uh, wave packets basically uh, behave essentially classical, okay? They behave uh, classically with the exception uh, uh, of, the, of the fact that the Hamiltonian that uh, describes this uh, motion is actually not your, you know, P squared over 2M or uh, P being, you know, uh, with long derivative instead of uh, P, but um, some band Hamiltonian that you got from the band structure, so you promote it to a classical Hamiltonian of a particle, you write down equations of motion, you solve them, and you see what particles do, okay? So that's the basic description that we're not going to really pursue much, but we we're going to look at corrections to that, where quantum mechanics uh, pops up uh, in this description, and uh, it will be popping up due to magnetic fields or very uh, phases in, in, the two, in the two lectures, okay? So, just to emphasize, 
uh, what one does, one writes down the uh, uh, Hamiltonian equations for the position of the wave packet and for its k. Okay, k position is advanced because of the uh, bent velocity, uh, gradient of uh, bent energy. Momentum is advanced because of forces acting uh, on the particle. Okay, and uh, instead of you know electric field, there is a gradient of this uh, uh, bent energy uh, written here. Okay, and uh, you know what one can do. For example, one can solve uh, Boltzmann equation and figure out a bunch of you know uh, transport coefficients. We're going to do that, do that tomorrow, not today. Okay, so yeah, so lecture uh, two will uh, discuss that, and it, it'll discuss you know quantum corrections uh, to these right hand sides uh, that um, David mentioned and what kind of observable uh, effects they uh, lead to. But uh, for now, let's get a feeling of this uh, classical description. What do these classical electrons do to see where, where the description fails? So the first, <clears throat> the first case I'm going to consider is a situation where there is a non-zero uniform uh, electric field, and there is a uh, zero magnetic field. Okay? So the equations of motion are extremely primitive in this case. So you see that uh, the derivative of R is just the bent velocity. And the derivative of the momentum, I switch from k to p, uh, uh, but it's the same, the same kind of thing, okay, uh, is given by the uh, electric force acting on the particle. So what, what is the trajectory? It's very simple. In momentum space, it's completely trivial. Momentum just changes linearly with, uh, with time, okay? And <clears throat> in, in real space, you just need to, you know, you start from somewhere, you, you integrate the velocity to get the displacement by the observation time, okay? So what happens here? Uh, what happens here uh, in reality? What kind of motion is, is this? Uh, to illustrate what can happen, uh, let's consider a very simple uh, one-dimensional tight binding model where the uh, particle can hop left and right with a particular hopping amplitude delta. I call it delta rather than t, not to mix it up with uh, time t. That is also part of this problem. So <clears throat> uh, the evolution uh, of momentum is very simple. You know, there is one-dimensional momentum that advances linearly in time. The, uh, okay, and then uh, we can simply uh, take the equation for the velocity of the particle, okay, expressed uh, through the uh, through the uh, bent velocity, okay, evaluated at a given momentum. This is the momentum at which I calculate the bent velocity, and what we get actually uh, uh, is oscillations in uh, in real space. Okay, so unlike a conventional particle that will just simply uh, accelerate uh, through the uh, real space indefinitely, the particle in this uh, one-dimensional band uh, model oscillates, uh, oscillates around a particular position, okay? And these oscillations are known under the uh, name of, uh, under the name of uh, Bloch oscillations, okay? So, I don't know, maybe since you ask uh, so many questions, let me ask you a question at this point. So, uh, some of you are experimentalists, right? Okay. Uh, very good. So if, if your advisor, say I'm, a, I'm a, your advisor, I tell you, go measure block oscillations, what should your reaction be? Like, is it a good project to, to work on, or is it a horrible project to work on? What, what do you think? Or, you know, if it's a horrible project, why? I mean, of course, if it was a good project, you know, the question would have been different. Please. You're absolutely right, but why do you need these high electric fields? Why, why can't you just uh, apply, you know, very, very small electric field and just wait for a couple of days until that thing oscillates and not heat up your sample? Because of what, sorry? Yeah, because of disorder and, and that type of uh, stuff. Okay, so let's see how, uh, how uh, uh, restrictive, basically, this condition is, that these oscillations uh, need uh, several oscillations to be completed, you know, to, to, to actually be observed, okay? So that means that the period of oscillations need to be uh, basically short as compared to some scattering time, right? We're going to do a little bit of kinetics here. So the period of oscillation here is clearly, where the hell is it? Here. It's, it's, you know, a one over frequency, and I equate it to some typical scattering time. So typical scattering times in, uh, in, in metals, in uh, doped semiconductors are, you know, picoseconds, okay? Uh, maybe one-tenth of a picosecond if, if it's not a great sample, or a picosecond if it's a sort of a decent sample, but you don't get much, much else. So if you plug in the numbers, you will get 10 to the 7th uh, volt per meters, okay? 
So this is a dimensionful uh, number. So is this a high uh, electric field or is this a small electric field? I, I don't have particularly great intuition about electric fields. So maybe you have this, uh, you know, Van der Graaff machine that you will, you will get to, you know, one million volts. And, you know, this, this thing will oscillate for you. Hmm? I mean, the number sure looks impressive, right? But, but if I measure it in volts per, you know, per parsec, the number will be very small. What do you mean typically? I just told you, I will take this Wonder Graph, you know, generator, create one million volts in it, and, and you know, it will not kill me because there is not much charge, but uh, the electric field will be very impressive around that thing. So how do we know electric field? I mean, very phases are important, don't get me wrong, but uh, what, what are high electric fields? All right, so somebody said, you know, it'll heat up the sample. How do you decide if, if it's going to heat up your sample? Kind of, kind of. How, how do you get ions to oscillate? Okay, this, this, this lecture is going to be three hours, okay, so we'll, uh, until we figure this out, I will not move on. So, okay, let me stop torturing you. So, basically, uh, whether, how you heat up the sample, what the uh, large electric field is, is determined by scattering, but inelastic scattering. We just talked about, you know, uh, impurity scattering and whatnot, but uh, inelastic scattering uh, tells you uh, how, how heat, heated up things become. So what should we check for? We should check whether this electric field, if, if we look at the work it does on the length between you know, two inelastic scatterings, whether that energy is substantial compared to some, uh, some other energy scale or not, okay? So the typical mean free pods for inelastic scattering are roughly speaking microns, okay? So, I mean, there is a bunch of experimentalists in the audience, so I'm risking here a little bit, but uh, you know, micron I think is a fair, uh, fair number, would you say? Yeah, okay. So anyways, if you multiply, you know, uh, 10 to the 7 uh, by uh, 10 to the minus 6, you get uh, 10 multiplied by the uh, charge of the electron, uh, you will get 10 electron volts, okay? So between the elastic scatterings, you, you will get 10 electron volt of energy pumped in your system. That is a lot by condensed matter standards, okay? So this is a gigantic field, which will basically evaporate your sample before you do anything. So one way to go about this is to, to make the lattice spacing uh, very, very large. So maybe this can be reasonably measured in some super lattices with gigantic A's. I plug in here like an angstrom for a crystal, but maybe it can be observed somewhere else. Okay, so let's talk about uh, uh, the situation with no electric field, but with, uh, with a magnetic field. Please. Maybe just a comment. Uh-huh. If, if instead of looking at electrons, you're looking at atoms, you're not because lattice, uh, the lattice spacing is much larger. Yeah, yeah, that's what people they call the atoms, right? You just, you just, you just need to make, uh, you need to make uh, a, a lattice whose A is not an angstrom. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh -huh. uh, as an advisor, actually, asking students to measure this, uh -huh. uh, I would say there's another, Run. there's another way out, and that is anisotropy. So if you consider this to be extremely anisotropic and having a different, uh, let's say, a planar system, uh -huh. very high in plane velocity, very low out of plane velocity, then you can end up in a situation in which if the scatterings are sufficiently large, you, with a magnetic field, you can wind the electrons into an orbit, and you suddenly make things very small, and you only have a very narrow gap because of a very small out of plane velocity, so the power density goes down a lot. The problem here, in some sense, is that a as the lattice point. That's right. For in both, both directions of motion, right? But if you have an A and a C, and they were different by orders of magnitude, there's another, another way out. Sure. Okay. So this is a real question, apparently, right, that one can actually ask. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Very good. So uh, let's talk about the magnetic field now. Uh, no electric field. So we, we're going to use electric field and magnetic field tomorrow. Okay. So for now, just one field uh, will suffice. So uh, in this case, in this case, the equa let, let me just put down right the equation uh, for the momentum only. Okay, that's the usual uh, you know magnetic part of the Lorentz force acting on your uh, charge carrier, but the the velocity as a function of momentum 
can be more or less arbitrarily complicated. That's the difference with, you know, uh, a free space motion, which you know absolutely know is just a circle perpendicular to the magnetic field, or maybe you know a uniform motion along the magnetic field. Okay, so but no matter what the dispersion is, no matter how uh, difficult it is, we can definitely say that the momentum projection onto the magnetic field is not changing, right? Because this uh, force is perpendicular to the magnetic field, and we can also uh, say that the energy of the particle will not be changing. Okay. Because, uh, because the force that acts is perpendicular to the velocity, so it will not do any work uh, on the uh, particle. So the energy, kinetic energy in particular, will stay constant. Okay? So if we, not after precise, you know, a time-dependent uh, uh, law of motion for this particle, but rather looking for the trajectory, just a line drawn in momentum space first, okay? we then know that this line will go, th uh, will basically uh, will go through a cross-section of, of the isoenergetic um, uh, surface by a plane of Pz equal to constant. You see what I'm saying? So Pz does not change. That means that your motion can be only in a plane perpendicular to Pz. Okay? And since energy does not change, you basically, uh, while you move in the plane perpendicular to Pz, you, you're constrained to move in, on an isoenergetic surface. So it's a cross-section of isoenergetic surface by Pz uh, equal to constant plane, okay? So uh, that this is the trajectory in momentum space, and a you know, particular, particular examples of what can happen is uh, shown here. By the way, these plots are taken from a paper by Lifshitz and uh, Kaganov on, uh, I forgot the name, quantum mechanics of electrons and a lot, something like that, I don't know. But, it, it, you know, uh, the, the people who wrote the paper are, are absolutely, uh, or you, were absolute, uh, you know, um, authorities uh, in the subject. So you have here a, uh, basically, a Fermi surface for sort of a layered system. Uh, you see, essentially, you, you have, uh, you have a, almost a cylindrical, almost a cylindrical Fermi surface modulated in the PZ direction, okay? That's, that's the stacking direction, okay? And you see that depending on how you, you orient your magnetic field, uh, you can get a situation where you have, you know, two small cross sections and large cross section. You you can, uh, you know, depending on the angle, you can have a this uh, beautiful, whatever figure this is, you know, uh, trajectory where these uh, three little pockets basically merge together. If you tilt the field uh, further, you will get, you know, uh, expanding, expanding figure like that. And actually, the situation where where these uh, little pockets almost touch is very, very interesting. That's where you can, um, you can expect tunneling between the trajectories, which is known under the name of magnetic breakdown, and I guess uh, Philip will, will mention that uh, too. So uh, just a quick, uh, quick word on, um, on the electrons versus holes. You always hear that. So we can figure out the, uh, the direction of motion uh, for, for the electrons uh, by, by just looking at the direction of the um, uh, Lorentz force. So the problem is that um, for electrons, E is negative, and the um, velocity can basically point, uh, uh, point, if you will, for you know, isotropic case, can point along momentum for electrons, electron-like uh, surfaces, and it can point opposite to a momentum for hole-like surfaces. Okay, so basically, if we draw a, um, a trajectory in momentum space, and, and I dash, uh, the region of energies which are smaller than the given energy, right? So for electron surfaces like this, it's inside. For whole uh, surfaces, it's outside. You can see that the motion will be always in such a way that the uh, area with a lower energy is to the left of the, of the particle. If you look in the direction of motion, the lower energies are to the, to the left or high energies to the right, okay? For both electrons and holes. So that's how you figure out the, the direction of motion. So uh, let me now get uh, uh, to the uh, sort of a cornerstone. Huh? Say it again. Oh, you just you just live with that. You just take all these trajectories into account. So I'm going to talk about you know quantum oscillations, okay? And uh, you, you, you're talking about some some like compensated situation, right? Where you have uh, overlapping overlapping bands and you have trajectories of both sides, that means that some electrons will go 
around magnetic field in, in that band, and some will, you know, some will be in this band, and some will be in this band. Unless they can tunnel from one to the other, then you have with this hybrid type uh, trajectories. Adapt, you know, what do you mean they adapt? Adapt in, in, in where? Ah, oh, yeah, in magnetic resistance, basically, you would, you would add conductivity tensors for, for the two bands, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, of course, having compensated systems is super, super important for observation of uh, magnetic resistance, so you know that's important. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, uh, Lifshitz on Zagar quantization. So I just told you that uh, uh, classical trajectories in magnetic field can form closed loops, okay? And as you know that when, when you have classically closed loops, periodic motion, okay, quantum mechanically it has got to be uh, quantized, right? So more or less quantization becomes important when the magnetic length, I, I didn't put it down here, but you know what it is, one over square root of B, becomes comparable to, to you know, relevant, uh, relevant scales, you know, Fermi wavelengths, uh, that, that's the situation where the quantization is the strongest, okay? So, um, what is going on here? So the idea basically is to take a classical closed trajectory and apply Bohr type uh, quantization rule to it, okay? So you know how Bohr quantized you know, classical trajectories uh, for hydrogen atom. Uh, here there is a quantization rule uh, after, named after Lifshitz and Onzager, which allows you to do a very similar thing for orbits in, uh, in uh, momentum space, okay? So, um, what do we do? Uh, we basically take the Hamiltonian of the uh, particle to be the band energy uh, at momentum shifted by the vector potential that produces the magnetic field, okay? This is the so-called Pyrrhus uh, substitution, which allows you to take into account magnetic field uh, in, in band uh, structure. So it works basically when, uh, when magnetic field, um, the, again, the magnetic length is much longer than the atomic, uh, the atomic um, uh, atomic uh, length, essentially, uh, lattice constant, okay? So we will use, uh, I don't know, we will not use, but, you know, it can be chosen uh, as, as uh, so, the uh, vector potential and magnetic field points in Z direction. We choose the direction to be along the mag uh, magnetic field. Okay, <clears throat> so as we discussed, the trajectory in momentum space goes uh, along a uh, isoenergetic surface with given PZ, okay? The uh, real space trajectory at least its projection onto the plane perpendicular to B, is related to the, um, uh, to the trajectory in the momentum space by this uh, force equation, essentially. I, I just took the Newton's second law multiplied by dt, and I see that displacement, displacement in real space is related to the displacement in momentum space by this law. Okay? Of course, the, the piece of dr that points along P is not part of this equation. You cannot get it from, from this equation. But per to B, you can. Okay? So, um, what is the quantization condition? Uh, the quantization condition, uh, as, as basically put down by Lifshitz uh, and on Zeiger, uh, would be just the, uh, you know, to calculate the classical action for the particle divided by H bar and equated uh, to 2 pi n plus this uh, famous gamma. Gamma depends very much on the spectrum, on the system, but it's one half for almost parabolic spectrum or, you know, spherically symmetric spectrum. Okay, this gamma comes from, uh, basically, from the turning point on the trajectory. You, you, you've seen this one half in, in classical uh, quantum mechanics when you, when you did semi-classical quantization. Okay, so more modern view on this would be to actually add the Berry phase accumulated along a closed path, because this is exactly what we're doing. The, the construction that uh, David described in his lecture is exactly what happens in this setup because the external field basically takes your particle and literally takes it around the closed trajectory in the parameter space, momentum space, quasi-momentum space in this case. So this is literally, literally the setup to measure the uh, Berry uh, phase, okay? So this is actually not quite correct, this equation that I wrote, but um, I wanna sort of mess with you later on, uh, so I will, not, I will fix it later on, but not now. Okay, but at least this, you know, the, uh, the addition of the Berry phase is uh, what you need to suspect at this point, okay? So the evaluation of, uh, of the action uh, is actually made possible by, by this relationship between the trajectories uh, in real and, and momentum space because this allows you to um, express dr through dp, essentially, okay, and then you, you only live in the momentum space, and there are people who actually spend their lives in momentum space, right? Um, Okay, so, uh, 
Imagine if I was trying to write this actually in real time. That would have been, would have been a sort of a pain. But let me just say that uh, this integral, let me just say that this integral, okay, through all these calculations, which I, of course, will post in Slack, or maybe there is a special place uh, on the website, Slack. I'll, I'll just provide these notes, so uh, they should, at least formulas should be readable. Okay, so uh, through, you know, uh, uh, short manipulations, you can, you can show that this integral is nothing but the area of the trajectory that you're moving around. Of course, we're talking about closed trajectories. I didn't mention that there can be open trajectories that never close, but those do not lead to quantization, so we disregard them. Okay, so uh, uh, basically, uh, basically you, uh, you can relate this uh, classical action to the area of the um, isoenergetic surface in the momentum space divided by, by EB. Okay, so Let me just uh, move here for, uh, for a second and forget about the uh, berry, berry face stuff uh, and uh, whatever else I mentioned, okay? And uh, discuss, uh, discuss uh, this quantization condition uh, briefly. So uh, what we get then is that the classical action, right, um, is, is, is an integer uh, number of two pi h bars, okay, plus this, you know, little gamma, okay? And that, of course, becomes the quantization condition for energy at given PZ, okay? So that leads to a certain, uh, certain uh, discrete spectrum, okay? And um, what is important, what is, important uh, is the uh, distance between the two neighboring uh, levels, okay? So we can simply subtract this equation for n and n plus 1 or n and n minus 1 to get the uh, distance in energy between the, uh, the two uh, levels, okay? So... Uh, this, uh, this distance in energy is related to the uh, energy derivative of the uh, area in the momentum space times, I already call this energy difference as, the, uh, as some h bar times uh, some frequency, okay? And you see that this special frequency basically is related to magnetic field and the so-called cyclotron mass, okay? So the cyclotron mass is uh, determined by the uh, energy derivative of the isoenergetic um, uh, surface uh, area, okay, and this uh, basically replaces the uh, the free electron mass or you know some band mass effective mass for arbitrary spectrum. Okay, so once once you hear cyclotron mass, the object, the the image that should appear in your in your mind is really a derivative of the isoenergetic uh, area uh, surface area to uh, with respect to energy. Okay, so that that what plays uh, the role, but that's what determines mass in all these magneto-oscillation phenomena, okay? So um, let's take this quantization rule and uh, apply it to a few uh, examples that we know very well, okay? So the first example, <coughs> excuse me, uh, would be, you know, the simplest possible, just some sort of a, uh, you know, P squared over 2M dispersion, okay? Which is actually not, not a bad approximation uh, for many semiconductors very close to the uh, band bottom or uh, valence band top. Okay, so uh, what do we need to do to apply this? Uh, we, we just need to calculate the area of a surface uh, that has the uh, given energy and a given PZ, okay, and then equ equate it to essentially an integer multiplied by some combination of fundamental constants and P, and we're done, okay? So the area here, of course, is, uh, is given by just the you know, pi times the uh, component of momentum perpendicular to pc squared, just regular area over circle, okay? Written here, okay, I just expressed p perp squared through energy that is fixed and pz that is fixed. Gamma we're gonna set to, to, to be one half, the, the, usual, uh, the usual case. And <clears throat> uh, upon plugging this in into the quantization condition, we immediately get the famous uh, the famous uh, harmonic oscillator spectrum for motion in magnetic field. Of course, there is this P, you know, kinetic energy along the Z direction that, that, uh, that's dangling there because it's not affected by magnetic field. And uh, the uh, cyclotron mass, the derivative of S with respect to uh, epsilon energy divided by 2 pi, is nothing but the band mass that you plug in. Of course, nothing else will come out. Okay, perfect. Let's go a little bit fancier. Let's do graphene, okay? So uh, graphene, uh, as you know, has this relativistic uh, spectrum, v, uh, v times P, okay? 
And, uh, in, uh, uh, you must know that the, there is a very phase of pi for a graphene. You, you, I mean, I will not ask who hasn't heard that because it's going to hurt to admit. Okay, so um, we play the same game. We play the same game. There is no PZ in this case at all, right? The system is two-dimensional. Very, very simple. Okay, so the, uh, the surface of the isoenergetic uh, surface area of the, this isoenergetic uh, uh, contour now is just uh, pi times p squared, which is energy squared divided by the uh, Dirac velocity squared. Okay, so, and as I said, we have to add uh, pi uh, to the left-hand side of the equation to, to get proper quantization. Okay, so the status of this pi is basically the same as the status of gamma. It's, it's a correction to, to this, you know, large n thing because the quantization works for large n technically. It, it just happens to work for any n for harmonic oscillators. Uh, but it's, it's, it's like a leading correction, basically. Um, so we need to uh, uh, take into account these both pi's on the, uh, on the two sides. And as a result, we basically get, because area is, you know, F's, uh, energy squared, we get the famous square root of n spectrum for graphene, okay? and the n is not offset by anything. So there is a, this uh, Landau level at n equal to zero, the famous zeroth Landau level, and working on that is, is subject of many, 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 many papers, okay? Perfect, okay? Everything works. So, of course, of course, of course, we need to do three-dimensional graphene, the Weyl's uh, metal, or metal, uh, that uh, uh, Jen mentioned, right? So. We first uh, will do it the simple way, without, without any uh, quantization, because we know the result for graphene. So if you look at the Weyl semimetal, at the Hamiltonian of a Weyl semimetal in magnetic field, with magnetic field pointing in Z direction, uh, you can split it basically in the sort of transverse part of the Hamiltonian, which is nothing but graphene, okay? And then, and then this, you know, sigma Z, PZ mass type term uh, because of motion in Z direction, okay? So because Z is a, a PZ is a, <clears throat> excuse me, is a constant of motion, you know, th this uh, term with uh, sigma Z is just, is just essentially PZ dependent gap. It doesn't do anything, uh, you know, uh, dynamically. It's just a gap in the spectrum. So if we know, if we know the spectrum for graphene, we just need to take square root of the, you know, sum of the squares and we're done, okay? And then you, you indeed get the uh, spectrum of uh, Landau levels in the Weyl cell metal, which is very, very important uh, to understand for this chiral anomaly and the chiral magnetic effect uh, thing that we're going to discuss tomorrow. So what you see is that there is a bunch of uh, sort of a normal Landau levels for non-zero n. They disperse, you know, uh, I should have put a, a, a picture here. Maybe I will add it uh, afterwards. Okay, they disperse like you would expect them disperse like this, okay? And there is a special Landau level. The, the fact that there's only one, but not two, I think, I don't know how to argue about this uh, uh, classically. You, you, you just have to solve the problem to see that only one wave function is uh, normalizable, essentially. Okay, there is a special uh, chiral Landau level. You see that it doesn't have any kind of mass. It just goes, uh, goes the energy goes linearly with PZ, so it just, you know, it has constant velocity. It all, all, only gets, you know, only goes that way, okay? It doesn't go that way, so it's chiral goes in one direction. So this is, uh, this is uh, basically uh, using, using the results for graphene. So now let's, let's try and, and forget that we know those results, okay? And uh, try to get uh, the spectrum from, uh, from this uh, Lifshitz on Zagger type quantization, okay? So, so I, just, I just don't do any crimes here, uh, seemingly. Again, I express the uh, area in the momentum space as p per perp squared, express it through energy in pz squared. Nothing particularly bad here, okay? I calculate the uh, Berry phase uh, for, uh, let's say, uh, a surface in conduction bend because I want to fix the uh, sign of the Berry curvature. And what I will get is minus pi sine pz, but there is this correction. Correction, it's essentially one minus uh, magnitude of v pz divided by total energy. Right. And in the last lecture, we learned that in 
So what you do is the following. So a magnetic field has two effects. It has a spin effect on the electron, and it has an orbital effect on the electron, okay? So spin effect would be captured by, uh, by adding some sort of B times B dot sigma uh, term to a Hamiltonian, which will just shift the position of the wild point. That's it, okay? So the orbital effect that we're talking about right now it, uh, it basically leads to this quantization that we're interested in. So the, the, the Zeeman part that, that moves things around, which is, it, it's a good, good point. I should have made that point, but uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, the, the other will just move in the opposite direction, okay? If you will, if you will, you, you can think about the separation of, of the two wild points in this simplest model as being determined by some sort of magnetization, underlying magnetization. Maybe there are some D electrons that provide magnetization for these S electrons to split. And magnetic field, the Zeeman part of magnetic field is really just adding to that magnetization and just moves these things around and does nothing else. So we're really looking at the orbital effect of it, okay? Okay, so we do it our way, uh, area, beautiful, very phase, very suspicious. So if we try to put this uh, back together, we see that, you know, in this, uh, in this quantization condition, this gamma will not be, I mean, it doesn't have to be canceled, you know, uh, basically, uh, gamma of zero is the same as gamma of one, of course, right? It's just, just a, you know, a shift of the origin for n's. So, but basically, you know, there is this uh, pi that we like very much, minus pi really dangling here, but there is this annoying piece that, that is not canceled by anything. That means that this gamma will not get canceled. That means we will not go back to the uh, spectrum that we got from graphene, uh, uh, graphene um, um, uh, story. So the question is, uh, what am I missing here? What did I forget about that led to this wrong result? This is a very, very hard question, okay? So I will start with a hint, which is also not a very useful hint, but I want to go through this slide, okay? So let me, let me give you this, okay? Let me give you a bit of history. So as you know, uh, the, uh, the spin of the electron uh, was not discovered uh, immediately, okay? So people, you know, in particular Pauli, uh, uh, explained the you know, stern gerlach type uh, experiment uh, by assuming that there is this additional discrete index associated with, uh, with electrons. And then people, of course, didn't know what it was. So Kronig, uh, you know, you, you have heard this uh, last name maybe in the context of Kronig uh, penny model, that type of stuff. So he made a guess that, that is famously discussed in textbooks, you know, uh, until now, that, uh, you know, uh, that index corresponded to the angular momentum of the electron, and that angular momentum corresponded to, to rotation uh, of the electron around some axis, and that was the spin. And the, the famous outcome of this is, is the story about Pauli yelling at the guy that, you know, it cannot be like that if you want to get the right, the right amount of angular momentum. The, the equator of the electron, if you take la classical radius of electron as they estimated for the size, will give you a speed the higher than the speed of light. So, you know, the guy was destroyed, you know, other people uh, basically figured out the, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, angular momentum thing. But then, you know, I'm not going to argue with the fact that spin is not self-rotation, okay? But then you go to a textbook, you know, a famous textbook, Landau Lifshitz, volume number three, it's quantum mechanics. You go to the uh, section that it's called mo motion in magnetic field or something like that. Anyways, there is a piece uh, on, uh, there is a chapter on current density in magnetic field. And what you see there, is the expression for the current density, which contains the piece that you, of course, very well know, right? There is the diamagnetic part, okay, proportional to the vector potential, and then there is this thing, right? And this is nothing but curl of spin magnetization. You see what I'm saying, right? So currents have many components, right? There is, there is, this, uh, there is this usual current, but there is also curl of, of magnetization current. If you, if you studied the microscopic electrodynamics, you must have been uh, uh, told about curl of magnetization current, time derivative of polarization current, all these macroscopic uh, currents flowing in the simple. So, so this is apparently a very much uh, real uh, current that comes from spin magnetization. But spin is not self-rotation. So what is the, what is the, I mean, if it's not self-rotation, it has nothing to do with, with motion in real space, how can you get the real electric current out of it? It's not a transport current, it cannot, 
you know, move charge to the sample. But nevertheless, it's a real current that, that flows around the sample. So what, what do you, how do you resolve this thing? I mean, no, nobody knows. I, I ask this all the time. Nobody knows. Right. Uh, uh, so, but maybe this time around is going to be different. It's, it's a very hard question. So let me let me tell you let me tell you this. So it turns out that uh, basically spin, the angular momentum, is, is really indeed a, a an intrinsic angular momentum. It doesn't correspond to any any kind of self rotation, but the magnetic moment associated with spin is in fact nothing but self rotation. Okay. So for a Dirac electron, you basically have a wave packet. Uh, the minimal size of the wave packet you can get is roughly speaking the Compton, Compton wavelengths, the 2.4 times 10 to the minus 12 or whatever, okay? Uh, one over MC, essentially, H, H over MC, okay? And basically, if you take this, this uh, blob uh, of size of Compton wavelengths and you rotate it with roughly speaking uh, angular speed such that the velocity at the equator is, is C, you will get exactly the right value for the, for the um, magnetic moment. And of course, you don't have to do that. This is very hand wavy. You can actually go through the Dirac equation, you know, do this usual projection on the conduction band, and you can, you can see how this magnetic moment actually is a self-rotation, okay? So that thing really, really just, just rotates around itself and produces magnetic, magnetic uh, moment, okay? So now let me go back to our problem and note that we, we actually did start with a, with a spinful model, right? There, there's spin involved in this problem, okay? And I'm telling you that magnetic moment that corresponds to the spin is, in fact, self-rotation, okay? So, uh, which will be important a little bit later. But uh, uh, basically, uh, this, uh, this uh, particle must have some sort of uh, magnetic moment, okay? As you know, magnetic moments uh, basically interact with... Uh, uh, with uh, magnetic fields, and there is a type of ineffective Zeeman uh, Zeeman uh, coupling, which nevertheless comes from purely orbital effect of the magnetic field. Okay, so so uh, the conclusion of this long discussion is that the actual energy, the actual energy of a particle in a magnetic field, is really band energy minus this effective effective uh, Zeeman energy which really comes from the orbital magnetic moment of the electron, okay? So let's try and take that into account and see uh, what, will, what will come out. Actually, do I have? All right, sorry, uh, I need to be here, okay? So uh, the, the long way to calculate this magnetic moment would be just uh, to use a very well-known expression for it, it, it looks very much like an expression for the Berry curvature uh, of, of the material, except there is this factor of Bloch Hamiltonian minus the energy of the band that you're calculating it for uh, in it, which makes it actually an independent quantity. In some simple models, uh, you can express magnetic moment through a Berry curvature, some you know, two bands with a particle hole symmetry. Uh, then they are related. In general, they are completely different uh, objects. Uh, so it, it would be incorrect uh, to, to say that one comes from the other or, you know, the other way around. So uh, instead of, you know, calculating this, which is long, uh, let's just uh, basically guess the result. Let's just uh, no, 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 note that uh, electron has uh, angular momentum that comes from basically orbital part and the spin part. And it turns out that this, you know, wave, wave packet or orbital momentum, not related to the motion uh, of the momentum, but self-rotation is actually zero. Okay, this canonical orbital momentum is zero. So only, uh, only the spin one survives. And as you know, uh, the, um, the wild electron, just like phonon, has definite helicity. It has definite projection of, of spin onto the direction of motion. So we immediately know that this average of the spin for a given momentum is just the, you know, unit vector in the direction of momentum or minus that for the other band, for, uh, for a valence band, okay? And then we can use the, uh, the, this usual conversion of the angular momentum into magnetic moment using the gyromagnetic ratio, okay? Except it's not clear what to use for M 
in this case because there is no M. We're dealing with a wild system, a massless system. So basically, in such uh, uh, circumstances, you, you use energy divided by V squared for mass, and you always get the, the right result. Okay? So you slab here this, uh, uh, this uh, modified uh, relativistic, I should call it relativistic gyromagnetic ratio, and boom, you get the right result for the magnetic moment. Okay? So uh, now, semi classical quantization needs to take into account that what is quantized, uh, what is, uh, you know, the area of, of what you're calculating corresponds to constant kinetic energy rather than uh, constant total energy, okay? So what you're looking for is the total energy of the electron. But what you're quantizing is really kinetic energy of the, of the electron. So you need to express this S, the um, area of the orbit in the momentum space, through actual energy, okay? And then, you know, uh, apply the quantization condition. So since total energy is kinetic energy minus mu b, the kinetic energy will be the one that we need to find, the total one plus mu b. Okay? So you basically plug it into the quantization condition. You expand uh, to linear order in magnetic field because that's, that's the order uh, we're working on, essentially, because you see there is one over magnetic field here, so it will cancel this magnetic field, uh, roughly speaking. And you will get some phase-looking contribution to this uh, quantization condition. So now if you do everything uh, correctly, you take the Berry phase, you take this magnetic moment, you do in fact uh, cancel this annoying P PZ piece from the Berry phase with a PZ piece from the magnetic moment, and you, you are back to the, uh, to the usual quantization uh, for, for the wild electron. So the lesson of this is that uh, in, in this semi-classical business, uh, besides the Berry phases, you have to always take into account, you know, these magnetic moments of the quasiparticles, and they, they often lead to uh, very, very important um, uh, results, which I will uh, try to describe uh, tomorrow. So, uh, finally, we get to the uh, central subject of, of this lecture. Let me uh, take a sip of water. Excuse me. So, I will uh, focus on the so-called Degas Van Alphen effect. It's a, it, these are oscillations of magnetization, okay, uh, in the presence of a magnetic field. But uh, I will try to convince you that uh, uh, what, what I'm going to be calculating will be roughly speaking applicable to uh, transport quantities uh, to the so-called Shubnikov Degas uh, effect, okay. Uh, but uh, Shubnikov Degas effect, being a transport phenomenon, is way harder is way harder to calculate than this uh, you know, thermodynamic uh, magnetization oscillation. So I'll, I'll stick with the thermodynamic case. To simplify my life, I will also stick with a two-dimensional system for now, okay, with parabolic dispersion, the simplest possible case, okay, and then we'll discuss how to generalize that to, you know, arbitrary uh, band structure in three dimensions, okay? So, uh, as we have just discussed, the energy spectrum of my system looks like so, okay? So, uh, because there is no motion in z-direction along magnetic field, I have just a set of discrete uh, Landau levels, okay? Right there, named obviously under, after Landau, who basically solved this problem for the first time and uh, explained the uh, oscillations. And uh, just in case, uh, I will add uh, basically uh, a Zeeman splitting for the electronic spectrum. Uh, in principle, uh, the two can be considered uh, independent um, uh, sort of uh, contributions. Uh, it, it seems like, you know, there is magnetic field hid hidden here, there is magnetic field hidden here, so you should lump them together into the same term. But the thing is that uh, Zeeman coupling, basically, is determined by the total magnetic field, the, the entire thing. And this, uh, this um, cyclotron uh, frequency is determined only by BZ, by magnetic field perpendicular to the sample, uh, sample um, uh, plane. So essentially, they, they have very different uh, angular dependence, and that, that's how you can actually, you know, uh, separate them in practice. So they are two independent things. I will not talk about this angle from now on because, you know, it's, there is a lot of things uh, besides that. Like a hint to 
No, not quite. So you see, I started with uh, with a while Hamiltonian, right? So it's a uh, it's it, it's not just strongly spin orbit coupled uh, system. It's the strongest possible spin orbit coupled uh, system because you know the spin orbit coupling sigma dot p is the entire Hamiltonian. Okay, so in that sense, there there is no longer you know a separate spin index you can assign to states, right? Because you know uh, the Hamiltonian couples spin sigma. To orbit p, right? There just there's nothing deep about that, right? Uh, so basically, there, there's no uh, there's no longer spin index, uh, separate spin index that you can basically use a, as a quantum number describing states. Okay, so th that that logic is really not, not there. Okay, so uh, j just to have a visual image of what's going on here, you basically have Lando levels. Uh, like so, these green lines. So, you know, the, the blue line is the original uh, parabolic dispersion. The horizontal lines are Lando levels, and they're split into these, you know, spin doublets. I'm assuming no, no spin orbit coupling for now, right? They're, uh, they're split by, uh, by the Zeeman term into these doublets, okay? So th this is the spectrum of our system. Okay, that part is done, okay? So uh, just to know what, we, uh, what, what the end result of our consideration is, let, let me tell you what experiments look like. So I, I tried to you know, find an ancient paper and a, a, a recent paper on the subject just to show, and, and then both you know, uh, uh, magnetization oscillation and uh, transport um, effect. So basically what you see here is that as you, as you change magnetic field, right, magnetization, uh, you know, we, we can talk about how it was measured, but it's not important for the time, uh, being basically describe these oscillations, okay, which I refer to as the Hasman Alpha oscillation, okay, and we will need to uh, basically explain the you know period of oscillation, magnitude, and so on and so forth, okay. So the same happened, and this this is from uh, Jim Eisenstein. Uh, he was at uh, Bell Labs at the, uh, at the time, and then there's another paper from uh, you know Professor uh, Ong's group on uh, Shubnikov the gas oscillations on a topological surface, okay. So it's another two-dimensional system which is sort of on top of a three-dimensional bulk. And again, here, what's measured is not magnetization, but uh, longitudinal resistance, okay? And then you also see oscillations, basically, oscillations as a function of here, inverse magnetic field. That's really the proper way to, to plot them, okay? And what you see is that oscillations change very much as you change the gate voltage that basically controls the number of, oscillation, uh, number of electrons uh, on, the, on the surface, okay? So this basically gives you a hint immediately that these oscillations have to do with how many electrons you have uh, on the surface, with how big the Fermi surface is, you know, that, that type of a uh, intuition. Okay, so we need to understand these oscillations. So the origin, uh, is, is like five, five minute thing? It's like, oh, 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 no, 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 like one minute of the first hour, I get it, I get it, then break, okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay, guys. Okay, guys. So let me let me let me uh, explain let me explain where the oscillations are coming from, and then um, I will tell you uh, basically in one minute uh, how to how to get them. Uh, as I said, you know, th this is just a conversation started. I'm around. I'm going to post the notes so we, we can we can discuss it um, uh, off uh, offline. So basically, the point is very simple. Imagine that I fix the chemical potential, the Fermi energy here, okay, this uh, thick red line, okay, and now uh, consider a situation where I, uh, I basically uh, increase the magnetic field, okay, in my, uh, in my system, such that these uh, Lando levels basically go up, okay? So what does it mean? That means that until, until this uh, Fermi, uh, Fermi level is between the... Uh, uh, Lando levels, nothing dramatic happens, right? You have a bunch of occupied levels, they just float up and nothing happens, okay? Oh, well, something happens, but nothing dramatic happens. But once, once a Lando level reaches the Fermi level and crosses it, then over a very, very small uh, range of magnetic fields, it basically gets rid of, of all of its electrons, okay? That means that there is actually a large change in the thermodynamic potential and energy of the system, okay? And that means that derivatives of the energy or, or thermodynamic potential, the first derivative uh, with respect to the magnetic field is the magnetization, will, uh, will experience a, a large change. Okay? And then nothing will happen until the next level comes, uh, comes up, and then you know, it, will, it will get rid of the electrons, and then will be another, another basically uh, kink in the magnetization, and so on and so forth. Okay? 
And of course, not only magnetization, but the density of states at the Fermi level oscillates, right? You, you have almost nothing if these levels are not too wide. And then you have lots and lots of density of states and they have, again, nothing, lots and lots, nothing. That means that scattering will be affected, right? That's where the Shubnik of the gas uh, oscillations are coming from. How electrons scatter depends on the available final states for them, right? Uh, and that, that is determined by uh, density of states and it oscillates so resistivity will also oscillate, okay? So basically these two um, effects can be kind of uh, related to the uh, density of states oscillations. And um, uh, since I have one minute left, right? Uh, right, right, it's that type of lecture. Um, so let, let, me just, let me just give you the result, okay? Let me just give you the result. And, and then, uh, sorry, Philip, I, I meant to, I meant to, uh, uh, cover more. So basically what you will uh, see <laughs> so, What? Huh? Yeah, 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 there's like only 20 pages left. I mean, come on. Adolfo is, is evil Right homework exactly homework. Oh my god Yeah, my apologies Yeah, how about we cancel the the surf thing? It's like give us three hours no? Okay. All right. So basically, uh, let, let me tell you what, um, what these uh, oscillations are sensitive to. Okay. So in the uh, oscillation, uh, in, the, uh, in these uh, oscillations of magnetization, you can basically have a, a they're usually written as this uh, sum over harmonics, whatever they are. Okay. And you see that there is a factor that basically is related uh, to the width of the Landau levels. It tells you the uh, scattering time of the electrons, okay, in your material. There is a piece that is, that is, deter that is related to the G factor of how, you know, how uh, sensitive the Zeeman energy is to the magnetic field. There is a piece that is sensitive to temperature, right? If temperature is very high, your, your electrons really smeared uh, among all my, my, you know, many Landau levels and there is no, nothing dramatic that happens as they cross uh, Fermi, uh, Fermi level, so you basically don't get any oscillation. So there is this uh, temperature suppression um, factor from which you can actually figure out the uh, effective mass, the cyclotron mass. And finally, there is this main oscillating factor, which is uh, sensitive to, to the Fermi energy of your system, or in general, to the area of the extremal, uh, of the extremal uh, cross sections. And let me uh, show you what they, what they look like. Basically, for a three-dimensional system, you have many two-dimensional systems for every PZ. So you have adding oscillations, and if the phase of the oscillation varies very fast, they basically kill each other. But if they if they do not uh, do not uh, uh, if the phase of the oscillation does not change much, this uh, this area is not really you know does not change fast with PZ. You 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 get basically uh, interferometric uh, uh, addition of the oscillation. They add together, and you get large signals. So that's why only these extremal cross sections, minimum or maximum. Uh, contribute to to the signal. Okay, so from from this you can basically learn everything about your system. You, you can you can basically learn something about disorder. You can uh, look at temperature and learn uh, cyclotron mass. You can look at spin. You can look at this Landau level offsets from the phase of oscillation. Uh, you can look at the uh, frequency of the oscillation, which gives you the um, cross sectional area. And you when you rotate magnetic field, you can figure out this in you know, external cross sections and really basically recover the entire. Uh, Fermi, uh, Fermi surface. Okay, so I, I'm sorry for going uh, over time a little bit, but uh, you know, you, you do not cover Ashcroft and Mermin in, in one hour, right? So, all right. Thank you. All right.